we are live. Welcome to Industry Thought Leaders. Our Hangouts fall series is about authority and how to use various tools and techniques to establish authority or to increase your authority um, to position yourself in your field. And today I'm very pleased to have Tom Curtis with us. He has written a book about the power of storytelling. And I picked up his book, I, it's on my Kindle, and I'm not finished with it. I took it with me on vacation, but I'm almost finished with it. And he had even some stories that I've heard before, stories that I haven't heard before. But I'm really glad that we're kickstarting this off with stories because stories allow us to share deeper who we are and that connects on a deeper level. Anyway, oh, so wait a moment. <laughs> That was me. Sorry. Did you hear that? Nope. <laughs> okay. YouTube went off uh, and started to uh, give the delay of me speaking on, oh, gotcha. on, on the Hangout. So anyway, without further ado, here's Tom. You just saw him. And I'm just going to give the microphone to Tom. And uh, please help feel welcome. And uh, let's hear what you have to say. Hey, how's it going? Glad to be here. This is my uh, first interview since writing my book. Um, so I, I should probably say a couple of things about me. I live in Southern California. That's where I was born and raised, uh, just outside of LA. Um, I grew up in a place called Torrance, California, and that is uh, one of the beach cities of Los Angeles. But then a couple of years ago, my wife and, and my three kids and I, we moved just outside of LA, about uh, half hour, 45 minutes north, to a place called Thousand Oaks, where it's uh, a little more mellow and a lot easier to get around and a little less stressful than, than LA. But I still have all my family back there, so uh, we go back periodically. We are heading down there in a couple of days again, so that's nice. Um, let's see, business-wise, I have always been an entrepreneur um, since I was a little kid. Uh, when I was in, I believe it was the third grade, I wanted to earn money to buy presents for my family for Christmas. And uh, I think it was like you know the first time I'd ever thought about buying presents for my family and I didn't know what to do to earn the money um, besides chores and uh, my dad came up with the idea that I could sell candy so this was uh, right around beginning of October when I was eight and my dad had an idea I could go sell candy to all the all the people in the neighborhood because they're gonna need candy to pass out at Halloween and so yeah, we had a good family friend that owned a candy factory nearby so my dad Worked out a great deal, and got some uh, some candy. Uh, I I'd like to say wholesale. He probably got it for free. Uh, it's a very good friend of my dad's. So anyway, I had a huge lot of suckers, <laughs> just plain candy suckers, and and you wouldn't you wouldn't dare give these to kids nowadays because that's the first thing they would toss out of their bag. Why? Uh, just because that's how plain they are. They're not you know it's not the cool candy anymore. Okay. It might have been back then. I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, you got to realize the neighborhood that I that I grew up in. My mom still lives there. Um, now at Halloween, um, like inner city kids are bust in to this neighborhood for Halloween. Uh, it, it's just a very safe neighborhood, and um, and so it it's just it's like there's thousands of kids, and you you can't even like drive down the street. So. And the candy's good. I think people probably spend at least three hundred dollars in candy now. Wow. Anyway, now, do you have an eight-year-old? I have a nine-year-old. <laughs> Any ideas? Is she is she or he? He he is uh, more entrepreneurial than I am. He oh. is constantly, constantly thinking about how he can make money. Do you think and he'd like to sell candy? It drives me nuts. <laughs> um, you know what? I, that's funny. I haven't even thought of that idea. Um, <laughs> My wife and I are about to start uh, selling products on Amazon, so we're going to have both of our boys doing that with us because we homeschool our boys, and uh, so we want to make entrepreneurship part of the part of the plan. But anyway, so uh, just to finish that story, I, I sold all that candy, and that was my first kind of entrepreneurial adventure. I bought presents for my family. I felt good. They felt good. It was you know a win-win. Um, and then I, I had various ideas over the years. One that's kind of funny is after I graduated high school, um, let's see, it was, I was actually about 19 at this time, and I thought I'd start my own business. And I guess the first and only thing I thought of was uh, to start a window washing business. And, <laughs> and that's uh, it's kind of funny. So 
I bought all the stuff, you know, I bought the uh, the cleaner, a squeegee, you know, whatever it is you needed to, to clean windows back then. And, uh, I, you know, okay, I'm in business, except, wait, oh, I need a, a customer. So here comes my dad again. Uh, my dad got me my first customer. It was kind of a rich friend of his that lived over by the beach, and she had a big house. And and so, you know, I thought, awesome. So I charged her like 100, 100 bucks, 120 bucks, something like that. And... Um, I think I charged her that before I even saw her house. <laughs> so she had a lot of windows. And you know what's interesting is, you know, I think growing up maybe I, if I ever washed windows, I would only washed the inside. <laughs> I didn't realize that there's actually an outside part of the window. And to get to some of the outside parts, you need to get like a ladder and stuff. And, and she had big tall bushes and trees that prevented me from getting to the outside. And uh, long story short, I swear it took me a whole week to wash those windows. So I, I don't know, I probably worked out, I, I, I made about 18 cents an hour. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. So that was my, my first and my last client, and that was the end of that business. But fast forward, I, I really think I, I got serious in business when I got married. Um, that's a good time to get serious. I had a couple of stupid, really just stupid jobs where, you know, talk about a stupid story. Um, when we first got married, I lived in Vegas, and I was working at this on this this job where I'm down on the strip in Vegas, and and it was just awful. I, I came home smelling like smoke every night, and uh, it was a terrible job. And I finally just had, had it. I'm like, I tell my wife, I'm like, look, I, I'm going to start a business. The only thing I knew how to do was roofing. Um, it's kind of a family business. My dad was a roofer. I I grew up kind of working with him, and I knew that I could do roofing. And here we are living in Vegas, and I'm like, I'm not going to do roofing in Vegas. Uh, I'll have to take the entire summer or spring through the fall off of work and find something else to do. So I thought, well, it's time to move to Southern California because I know I can I can start my roofing business there. So started the roofing business there and uh, it was it was terrifying at first. It was terrifying and exciting, right? But uh, it's interesting though the one thing that I decided to do no matter what was I was going to tell a good story and I, and I didn't that wasn't like the mindset that I had at the time as far as you know anything to do with story but what was happening is I wanted to start this business and and be the best um, and and not for my own ego but because I knew that I was going to be serving customers so I I my roofing business uh, caters to um, homeowner associ condominium homeowner associations and so I work with the property managers that um, that manage those places and so those were the people that I talked to the most they were the ones that gave me the work and I knew going into it that a lot that, that most of the roofers that they deal with if not all of them just weren't weren't cutting it weren't you know just weren't doing the work the, the right way weren't showing up on time you know just weren't easy to communicate with and I knew that I had them beat in that way um, I had the people skills I had the good work and uh, it was just it was easy to work with me, and so I set out to to really to tell a, a better story than than what those managers were used to hearing, and it worked. And I grew my business uh, fairly easily, and it became very successful. And and then uh, fast forward a little bit to I'm trying to remember what year I think it's around 2008 2009. Um, my wife was reading a book and. She was telling me all about it, and so I decided to buy myself a copy. And the book is called A Million Miles in a Thousand Years by Donald Miller. And it's it's a book about telling a good story, living a good story with your life. Now, I've gone on to read that book maybe seven times. Wow. And so it was a big inspiration for me to write my book. I mean, ever since I read that book for the first time, I was just really obsessed with and focused on stories and storytelling and, and and mainly what kind of story am I telling with my life am I living a good story you know am I living a stupid story or is it something that's remarkable and and worth sharing and so it really it really uh, put me into a different mindset to not only live a good story but to start telling a good story and a better story with everything that I was doing um, and you know like I said with the roofing company I was already telling a good story but it helped me to to really get down to what do these property managers that I work with, what do they really need? What is what is their biggest pain? 
you know, what can I, how can I really serve them the best? And, you know, and I realized that my whole job, my whole job within my company was to make their job easier. And then I even whittled it down even more. How can I, how can I tell a better story than that? And what I realized is that these managers get phone calls from grumpy homeowners all day long. And I could never have that job. That would, that would drive me nuts. Um, but that's, that's, that's what they're dealing with all day. And the thing that they hate the worst, and I asked, I asked around and I found this out, the thing they hate the worst is getting a second phone call from an even grumpier homeowner that's already called in, and they're calling in a second time for the same issue. Right, and, yeah. and so like one of those issues could be, hey, I got a roof leak, and I haven't heard from any roofer. And they call in again, they're even more mad, right? They're not happy that they got a roof leak to begin with when they call the first time. Now they call the second time, and, and they're even more grumpy. So I knew that anybody knew that I was going to work with, any new property manager, I could start out by telling them a great story, help them to also live a better story in their job by helping them to eliminate that second phone call. And so when I, when I went into them and I said, Here, here's what I can do for you, you know, let's start, let's start living and telling a better story together. I'm going to eliminate a whole bunch of these second phone calls that you get as far as, you know, roofs are related. And it just, they kind of lit up when that happened. And, and so I knew then I was, I was telling a better story with, uh, with my business. And so what led me there was, you know, after that was, you know, well, how can I help other businesses to, to do the same thing? There's businesses all over the place telling mediocre and really stupid stories by, you know, and, and everything that they're doing is telling a story. A business is always telling a story with everything that they do. And and especially it's not just, when they don't believe that they they don't think they're not aware that they are. Yeah. And yeah, that's the thing. They're just not aware of it. And and you know, it's it's I don't know what it is. You know, I, I imagine just about every business owner when they start their business, they're really excited. Here they are. They're they're venturing out to, uh, away from what they were doing before. Maybe they had a corporate job or some regular job or some whatever job that they hated. And they're like, okay, I need to start my own business. Okay, that's what that's what happened to me. I, I had actually two just terrible jobs and and it was just like I gotta start my own business or I'm not gonna be happy and I wanted to do that all my life anyway so you know business owners I think are excited in the beginning then maybe they get complacent they forget the reason they forget the story that it, you know inspired them to start their business in the first place you know that's part of the story but then everything they do from the products and the services they have those tell a story the customer service tells a story the marketing, the advertising, everything. And they're just not aware of it. And so I thought, well, I'm aware of it. And I should probably do something to help other businesses, you know, become aware of it. And so that that led me to uh, to writing the book. You got a question, I can see it. I do have a question because how we came across each other was probably about a year ago and you interviewed me. Yes. And you were talking about stories back then. And so my question to you is, how long did you go from this realization that you could do something with stories to the actual time that you sat down and did something with, with the concept Total. of stories in the sense of the book? Okay, so it's it's funny. The book that I started out to write, so um, the, the span between deciding to write the book and the book that I published was about two and a half years. But the book that I decided to write was not the book that I published. <laughs> it, it, so I, I first set out to, to write a, mark, a book just about marketing. And, you know, I thought, well, businesses really need to work on their marketing. They just, you know, for the most part, most businesses are, especially small local businesses, are struggling, you know, getting new customers and keeping the customers that they have. And it's just really all related to their marketing. But... I didn't realize that, wait, I can, I can use this, this power of story and this idea and this, this love for telling a good story that I have and put it in this book. And so it was actually about you know, halfway through writing this book that I decided, oh, I need to make this story focused. And, uh, and, that, and it was about halfway through that I came up with the idea for the name, The Story Economy. And that came from, um, you know, this different words used with that word economy 
Um, I remember Seth Godin uh, in a couple of his books and, and his uh, blog posts, you know, he likes to talk about um, the connection economy. Um, let's see, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk wrote a book, The Thank You Economy, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, that's perfect. I'll call mine The Story Economy. Awesome. You know? And so, um, yeah, so from there, then, then uh, it started to really develop a lot easier and a lot better. It's not that I didn't have lags, lags in time of, you know, or get to the point where I just, I hated writing a book. That happened several times. Um, but I just kept plugging away and plugging away. And then I, and then I realized, well, I need, I need, there's got to be, what's the mechanism for telling the story in a business? You know, what's the process? Is, is there, is there kind of a system that, that I can ex use in the book and help business owners kind of take some action and, and, and know how to make their story better, more remarkable. And that's where I came up with the idea. Well, and, and this is funny, I was in the hospital when it, when it came to me. Because when you're in the hospital, you have nothing else to do <laughs> but think about how you're going to write your book. So I was in the hospital for like four days, and this was back in uh, late March, uh, about a month and a half before I published the book. But that's where I came up with the idea was, wait, the, the story is really told within the sales and marketing funnel, you know? And so I thought, okay, so let's, let's describe how the sales and marketing funnel works in just basic terms. You know, you can get, you can get pretty complicated if you let it, but I just thought, now we'll explain how the story is told within the marketing funnel and we'll go from there. And when I came up with that, it was really easy to finish the book. Cause I think before that I was like, well, why is anybody going to read this? It's more like a, it's, it's, it's more like a, a philosophy book. <laughs> And I don't want it. I don't want that. I want people that read the book to have something where they can really take some action on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then that was the development of the book. And then I uh, published it in uh, May of this year, 2014. And on day one, it became a number one bestseller on Amazon in my categories. So I was pretty stoked. That is uh, congratulations. That is Thank a good, you. good, uh, a good result, especially that quickly. Um, and I think that plays well in with your your networking. I mean, you do work hard. So please, we talked about this a little bit before we went live, and so I kind of know a bit of the answer. But I like to hear from you. Um, what's the post story? What's happened after publishing? How does that allow you to engage, to inspire business owners to actually? find their own story, develop their own story. Where is that going now, and what are your plans for the future? I'll tell you what, the most exciting part with it is it's not any of the like, recognition or anything. It's, it's when people – so I just went to a conference in Dallas, and, and uh, it was, there was a lot of people that had bought and read my book, and I had people coming up to me telling me like specific parts of the book that they enjoyed and how it's helping them in their business. And, uh, oh, in particular, there was one guy – there, who flew in from Singapore. Wow. And he has a product called Freedom Soap. And the idea behind Freedom Soap, and his name is Jason Tay, um, uh, last name is spelled T-A-Y, I wanted to give him a shout out because this guy's awesome. But he's got this soap called Freedom Soap, and the idea behind the freedom is that it's, it's free of child labor in its awesome. manufacturing, and free of, you know, all the bad chemical stuff that we usually have in store-bought soap. And so he's telling a great story with this soap. But what does he do? He leaves me my best interview or uh, interview, uh, best review on Amazon for my book. And through Facebook, he had actually sent me a message and was like, your book is like the go-to reference for, for how we're launching this product and the, and the story behind it. And so when somebody tells you something like that, it's like, wow, I did something meaningful. And I, I really, I, I thought, well, you know, if I could just get one person that reads the book that, you know, it inspires them, it, it, it helps them in some way in their business, even in their personal life, whatever, I'm going to be excited. And, and so to have somebody like that say, I mean, it's, this is our go-to reference, like, what? My little book that, that with the bad grammar, <laughs> you know, um, and so I was really excited to, to have that happen. So going forward, I mean, that's, that's my goal is just, who, you know, who, else, who else's hands can I put this book into that can help them in their business in even just the tiniest way? It's like if it can just create a mind shift in, in just one business uh, where they just like, okay, 
yeah, I've been telling kind of a dumb story for a while. Maybe I started out with a good story, but yeah, the story of my business has gotten kind of dumb. Can I can I shift that and, and change that and and start telling a better story? Can we make our products a little bit better? How about our customer service? Are we telling a good story there? No, let's change some things. So going forward, that's my goal. I want to I want to help business owners just one at a time, just tell a better story. And I think because they network with other business owners. If you own a business, you're you're always talking to other business owners, whether on purpose or just by default. They're always talking to each other. And if one says, hey, how, how's your business? Well, you know what? It's doing a lot better. I read this book about telling a better story with my business, and it's really changed things a lot. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, if I can, if that can happen in some way, that will be awesome. Um, and so that's my goal, and I'm just going to continue networking and sharing it. And uh, I've actually got a podcast I'm going to launch where I'll talk about the book here and there and uh, hope to inspire other other people to tell a better story. You know what I think would be uh, a really great sequel is to have a collection of the stories that have started because of the book. That would be, I think a lot of people would be very interested in that and helps to inspire, especially I'm thinking the more people you touch and diverse, I mean this, the Freedom Soap, but maybe Roofers, you know, I mean two totally different worlds um, and to see that then play out in the real world and have those as the actual stories, the impacts that come from that would uh, would certainly interest me. And I think um, what we're doing here right now is we're kickstarting our fall series on how to use various techniques and tools for uh, for thought leadership and for establishing your authority, for positioning yourself and, uh, and moving forward in your business. And the story, your topic is the one that's falling totally out of the frame, but I was glad to have you. You're the first one. <laughs> I'm glad to have you here because the story is an element that you're going to have to have on all of the platforms that you use. So basically one of them is Hangouts, or the other one could be a blog, or it could be your Facebook fan page, but wherever you're presenting yourself in your business, the main key underlying principle has to be your understanding of your story, how you're connecting face to face, even if, I mean, you're in California, I'm in Germany, right? <laughs> and we're still communicating face to face and chatting awesome. with each other. And and um, that kind of a connection, but just also the very fact, you know, an entrepreneurial person who was out there getting candy and so on and so forth, you know, that's going to resonate with that person who had a drive earlier to do something off the beaten path, um, but to accomplish something. But not only that, your story tells family orientation tells you know it tells so there's so many facets in there that allow you to connect with other people and so for those who are listening to the show I want to encourage you to pick up a copy of of, um, of uh, Tom's book and let me get the title for you or Tom if you can tell us the title the story economy I think it was yeah, it's As the a story, story economy. Yep. How to use the power of the story in your marketing funnel to attract and keep more customers and uh, grab a grab a hold of it. I mean, I, I actually, it was, it was funny, when I was reading it, um, you know, I came across old friends, so to speak, firemen like Mike Lemoyne, I mean, just, and there was, um, I think you had, you quoted... I was just with uh, Mike in Dallas at that conference. I yeah. think you quoted uh, Diego Rodriguez, could it be that you quoted him in the book? Anyway, there was a few people in there, and I'm just like, I know them, I, <laughs> I've actually met them, <laughs> and, and that's a fascinating thing for being out here in the middle of Germany, I haven't met very many Americans. <laughs> and happen to have run into them. But the point is, is when you read about the stories and you, when you allow yourself to be inspired and just start to understand that your marketing is talking to people. That's basically what your mar that's what you want to do. You want to communicate with people and just being real, being having a face and having a soul. It's difficult if it's a larger business. As an entrepreneur, it's me. That's my story. <laughs> it's easier to control or contain. Whereas if I was an entity of five people, that's like five times the story. How do you control that? What's the what's the general factor that you're going for? But still, it's not a reason to shy away from having a story and moving forward with a story. Um, yeah. Uh, so what you were just saying, that, that, that'll uh, segue into this other story I have to tell. Um, but you were saying, you know, marketing is is telling people something, is telling people things. Like, I can't remember exactly how you just said it, but, um, you know, marketing is storytelling. That's all That's all it is, really. It's it's storytelling. And, you know, you, you've, you, you're pulling in and attract, hopefully you're pulling in and attracting, you know, new customers instead of pushing at them. There's the difference between push and pull. 
and you know attraction is pulling them in, and you're doing that by you know you've got a good story to share, a good story to tell that the other people are going to want to share. So I relate this story in, or I talk about this story in my book, and it's about Chipotle. Do you guys have Chipotle? In Germany. I have no idea what you're talking okay. about. So Chipotle is a, uh, a fast food Mexican restaurant, and uh, it's got good food, and and my wife and I love going there. But I'll tell you why I love going there even more now. Um, so it was last year, I believe, um, Chipotle teamed up with, and I got notes here, so I'm going to refer back to notes to make sure I get this all right. They teamed up with an Academy Award winning um, studio, uh, production studio called Moonbot mm -hmm. Studios. To create this this uh, animated short film, and so the story goes is there's, there's the scarecrow, okay, in this uh, in this film, and he works f for what looks like a giant like big dairy and poultry poultry conglomerate, right? And so he goes to work, and when he goes to work, it's this giant operation, and he walks in, and it's this grand thing, and and it looks like the scarecrow is like uh, kind of like a maintenance guy. Where he goes around, he fixes different things around the the buildings and stuff. And so, he's going around, he's fixing stuff. And one cool thing about the about the the little movie is that the music they have is is music from the original um, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Okay. And it's, so it's really cool. Um, and and so here's this scarecrow, and he's going around, and he's and he's fixing stuff. And there's this one part where he goes in, and he's He's gonna like fix a little wall or something, and he looks in, and and here's this this chicken. It's like being held by this like mechanical hands or whatever. And here comes this this big old needle, and it injects him with the chicken with something. And all of a sudden, the chicken just plumps up to like double the size. And the scare, and then, and then so then it goes back to the scarecrow's face, and he's just kind of like, you know, it's got sort of this kind of disturbed look on his face. Like, wow, that that wasn't good. I didn't like seeing that. And then uh, he's, you know, whisked away, and he goes up to a taller part of the building, and he's going to fix something else, and he sees these cows that are locked in these, like, metal boxes, and just the head is coming out of the box. There's a tag on the ear, and then there's this machine hooked to the side of the box, and it's just pumping milk out of the cows, you know? And, you know, it's no more are the cows out in the, in the field in the pasture, and, they, mm -hmm. you know, when it's milk time, they come into the farm, right, into the barn. So... At that point, the the scarecrow is just very disturbed. He's just like, but and it's really amazing how this studio captured, like, it made this scarecrow, this animated scarecrow, and the look on his face, and the look on his face is telling a story of like, this is terrible. I, I can't believe that I'm seeing this. Is this the this is the company that I work for? I had no idea. You know, it's like he's he's out on the fringes doing repairs, not really seeing what's going on until he's doing repairs on the side of the building and looks in, kind of peeks in, and is like, this is awful. This is terrible. So the next scene is uh, the scarecrow. He's going back home. He's like taking the bus or the train or whatever, and he's passing by these fields and, uh, you know, where all this, all these crops and stuff are being harvested and uh, whatnot, and there's this big, like, billboard sign out in the middle of the field, and, and it's got his his image on it and the the name of the company and the slogan says feeding the world and so he's even even more disturbed it's like well here's his image on the billboard and it says feeding the world as if it's this great and grand thing that they're doing but they're feeding the world crap you know this hormone injected chicken and this mm -hmm. these cows that are just pumping milk like 24 7 you know stuck in these boxes and it's just really disturbing to him so he goes home and he, it's like he lives on a farm. And so the scarecrow's like, you can just tell immediately, I can't live this story anymore. I've got, I've got to contribute better and, and, and live a better story and contribute to the world and, and help the world to live a better story. So he starts picking vegetables from his own garden and starts collecting all this stuff. And then he puts it in the back of his truck and he's driving back to the city where he was working. And, uh, you know, sets up a little shop or whatever, and it shows him, you know, cutting up the vegetables and making all this great food. And then he puts this food out onto this uh, little ledge for people to come and buy. And it's just – so the image there is like all of this good, wholesome food that's grown naturally without all the hormones and the chemicals and byproducts and all that. 
So this is this is a, a short film that Chipotle paid to have produced, but it doesn't it didn't show the name Chipotle. They didn't have their image or anything in there. The one so they have a uh, a pepper a red pepper um, that's in their logo, mm -hmm. and so there's one part where the scarecrow picks a red pepper off the bush, but but it's like it's you know he's just collecting vegetables and that was like their only little plug in for their business i guess so what what is chipotle how are they using this to tell a, a story a better story well what they've done is they've they've taken this bar and raised the bar and said here's how we are operating so they they only use all natural products okay they don't have any gen genetically modified food organisms or anything in their food it's all organic and all this other stuff and so they're raising the bar and what they're doing by saying that by raising the bar is they're telling a story saying hey this is how we're choosing to be this is what we want to tell to the world and we're telling it by the food that we prepare by the food that we serve you we care about your health we care about your well-being we care and in turn we care about your family and so we're gonna give you good wholesome healthy food to eat and so what are they saying to the rest of the world, to all the other restaurants? You know, they've, they've basically, by raising the bar, they're like, okay, here's where we're going to operate. Are you still going to be down here serving crappy food? They're saying this to all the other restaurants. And out, and of, fear for, out of fear for my life, I won't name them. <laughs> but the <laughs> but they're is, saying, yeah. you know, this is what we're going to do, and this is the story we're going to tell. And because... And because it they went viral. Because they come come out and say and tell a story like that, um, uh, before anybody else come out comes out and tells a story like that, it doesn't matter what any of the other restaurants. It doesn't matter if any of the other restaurants who who didn't do it before they did, are also doing the exact same things they're doing. Simply because they position themselves first and said this is what we're doing. Everybody else can only say me too, me too. But they can't say, we were the first ones to stick our neck out and say this is what we were doing. And that is also the power of now, now taking the opportunity to sit down and figure out your story. Now figuring out how you're going to convey that to the people who are listening. I remember when I was a kid um, in the 70s, McDonald's, and I'm talking about food industry, but McDonald's had, they had commercials that came out that made people cry. That's how touching the stories were that they that they had there, <laughs> and it had nothing to do with food. It was it was it like didn't. it was it was families out and doing things, you know. And it was it was touching the soul. And then at the end, you know, somebody would pack out some McDonald's burger or something like that. But that was they had they had a they had it must have been in the later 80s or 90s actually 80s 80s when when these commercials came out. Um, but they had a powerful impact on people, um, on people like my parents' gen like generation, or people just a few years younger than my parents who were just like, I just can't watch a McDonald's commercial without crying. I'm like I'm just like, come on, give over. It's a commercial, right? When I was a kid and not at that emotional stage in life, whatever. The point is, is that they knew how to tell a story to reach. And I have no idea what McDonald's does for commercials these days. I, I have no access to North American television, but the point is... I don't is, think they're making anybody cry. <laughs> 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 well, that's, that's quite possible. But Coca-Cola, for example, today, nowadays, I know that they're using a lot of story in their, in their commercials in their Coke machines that they put out there and people will, you know, open them up and share with each other or whatever their stories are. BMW with the what is it? Darth Vader. Get the thing to move. Isn't that BMW or Audi or something? It's a German car. Oh, that's a uh, <laughs> Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Yeah, it's it a German Volkswagen. car. It's, yep. it's a German car. I should know. But uh, no, I, I'm not a big person on Something commercial. interesting you just said. So you mentioned Coke, and I don't know if this is happening over in Germany or Europe or anywhere, but over here, so what Coke has done now is they're putting na people's names yes. on the labels of Coke, Diet Coke, you know, their Coke products. What is that doing? So it's funny. Do you ever get excited when you go to uh, a gift shop or whatever and they've got the little Cups mini license plates or, and the little yeah, shot glasses or, and whatever? They have your name on it. Do yeah. you ever get excited? I, I look at those and I'm like, oh, cool, yeah, there's my name. And then I walk away. I'm not excited at all. Probably but like my, most people. Now, look at what Coke's done. Everybody's excited. I have a friend who has collected... A bottle of Coke 
with all of her the names of her family except for one. So she posts on Facebook. She's like, hey, if anybody sees the name of my son on a Coke bottle, please grab it for me and I'll be super grateful. Oh my gosh, talk about this viral campaign. But, you know, it's a great story. People love their name. But for whatever reason, they're not getting super excited about the little tiny license plates with their name on them that you buy at a gift shop. They're excited because Coke is slapping names of people on the, on their labels. Well, that's because, I mean, if you, um, when, I, when I first came to Europe, uh, I remember taking home with me uh, Coca-Cola bottles, glasses, like a gla like from a restaurant, a glass that had the, like, the imprint of Coca-Cola on it, and taking them home with me from the various countries that I visited in Europe. And, I mean, Coca-Cola is a cult item anyway, whether you drink, I don't drink Coke. I've never been a pop drinker. <laughs> I never has. I've never been a big soda drinker. But because it's such a cult item, it was something that you brought back and you could show people that this is coming from from Coca-Cola, and they could see, wow, it looks so different in other countries of the world, and that's a pretty funny language. And you know, they don't call uh, diet Coke diet Coke here; they call it Coke Light, just things like that. <laughs> and it's it's a cult it's a cult thing. And the people who you see on on social media asking for the bottle, what age are they? I don't know how about young kids are. Maybe they're not that indoctrinated in the cult yet, but they will be. And, um, but my generation, we grew up with that. That was pretty much all there was to drink, as far as as far as the pop, pop, Coke and Pepsi. That was it. And of course, every year Coke and Pepsi had their taste off. <laughs> and so, even in my own personal <laughs> the Pepsi challenge, yeah. yeah, in my own person, in my own personal, in my own personal circle of influence, one out of ten people admitted to liking Pepsi more than Coke. But I mean, that was a big thing. To admit that you didn't like Coke, um, you know, it was just that's that's the way it is, you know. There was a movie that I saw once, and it had a there was a bus with an ad on it, and it said uh, Pepsi when they don't have Coke. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Listen, Tom, it's been great talking to you. I'd like to encourage everybody who's been listening to grab a hold of the Story Economy by Tom Curtis, and uh, I look forward to inviting you back on the show, Tom, when you have your stories all collected together, either to present great. your podcast or to present your second publication out there. It would be really great. It's great catching up to you and hearing your stories, but also just talking about how stories can really have an impact. Well, thanks for having me on. This was awesome. I love doing this kind of stuff. Okay. Well, take care and say hi to your wife and have fun with the soccer game. You have one tonight. Practice. Don't forget. Yeah, practice. <laughs> two of them. <laughs> All right, then. Have a good evening or have a good day. It's evening time here, so you still have the whole day ahead of you. So. Bright and early. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Andrea. Bye.